Did it work? Uh, yeah, I see the little red light come on. It says Melissa is recording the call. Perfect. So, all sure. right. Okay, so I'll just kind of introduce you, and then we'll we'll okay. go into it. Okay, so with me I have Carl Koppelman, who um, we're going to learn a little bit about what he does. So, hi, Carl. Thanks so much for joining me. Hi, Melissa. Great to be here. So, Carl, why don't you explain a little bit, like what you're doing? Well, my my uh, my mission, I guess, is, is the best way to put it. That what I've been doing for the last uh, uh, decade is uh, researching and trying to solve uh, unidentified decedent cases. Uh, John Doe's and Jane Doe's, who for whatever reason uh, um, have, have died and have, the, the authorities have been unable to identify them, that uh, um, became kind of a, uh, uh, there, there were a lot of resources that had come along uh, online. Uh, in particular, there was the Doe Network and uh, there was also the uh, the NamUs system where um, uh, unidentified John Doe and Jane Doe cases were available online, listings of them. And so um, with that came a whole community of uh, online sleuths who um, took it upon themselves to try to see if they could solve some of these things. And it's kind of snowballed into uh, <laughs> quite a uh, you know, ten, 10 years now of, a, you know, a, you know, a mission that I've kind of been on. So I, I initially got into it when I was a caretaker for my mother, who who is now deceased. But um, for eight years, I was her caretaker and had a lot of time at home. And so I, uh, I, uh, you know, in my spare time when I was around at the house caring for her, I could sit on the computer and research these cases. And it, you know, became, um, you know, something I like doing you know, whenever I had the spare time to do it. Uh, and then in 2014, I, I became involved in the resolution of a pretty prominent case, uh, a case out of New York from 1979. Uh, a teenage girl was murdered and they were never able to identify her. And um, in 2014, I was able to, I found a missing persons listing online and recognize her as that girl who was murdered in New York. So with that came uh, a lot of national recognition and um, I became well known in in the field of, it, of online sleuthing because of, primarily because of that, because of what happened with the, with the uh, Caledonia Jane Doe case who was identified as uh, a girl named Tammy Jo Alexander, and she was from Brooksville, Florida. Wow. So w was this initially what you like started doing in life or were, is this like it, something you just kind of took up? Just, just kind of started on a whim. Uh, actually, it was back in 2009, the J.C. Dugard story caught my attention and I was very much uh, um, fascinated by the J.C. New Guard story. It was an 11-year-old girl who was kidnapped and spent 18 years in captivity, and everybody thought she was dead, and then one day she showed up in a probation office with her captor and was recognized as J.C. and was returned to her, her mother, and, you know, she was, by then she was 29 years old, but um, that that story I was very captivated by and very uh, fascinated by, and, and, uh, in researching stories for um, for uh, J.C. Dugard, I came across Web Sleuths and saw that um, actually I was Googling J.C.'s name and her name came up in the context of a discussion of a Jane Doe who was uh, who died on the highway in uh, Arizona. It was a 16 year old girl who they were also unable to identify. And it took about nine or 10 years before they were eventually were able to identify her. But uh, it was in part because of the discussion on Web Sleuth. The, the girl's brother found the discussion of the case on Web Sleuth and recognized the the uh, unidentified girl as, her, as his sister. So um, J.C. Dugard was being discussed as a possible identity of that girl. And 
And so that's how I found that discussion by Googling the name J.C. Ugard. And uh, I became fascinated by this whole um, group of people who were working on these John Doe and Jane Doe cases. And I had never really been aware of that prior to that. But I, I, I saw that a few cases had been solved, the, the cases that were, you know, decades old where, you know, people online were able to solve it. And so I, uh, I became interested in that and started, you know, doing, trying to work these cases myself. Mm -hmm. So what, I mean, can you talk about the first case that you were ever like truly like what, I, I know you said JC was kind of like the gateway into yeah, the Yeah, it was the gateway. That was kind of what, mm -hmm. how I found web sleuths. And now I found out that there was a whole community of people uh, researching these cases. And I've always been kind of interested in kind of true crime type of stories. So, you know, that was just kind of right down my alley. So um, eventually... I don't know. I can't remember if there was a single case that, you know, was the first case I got interested. I know Caledonia Jane Doe was one of the earliest ones. And then there was Walker County Jane Doe as well, which was also a teenage girl found in uh, Huntsville, Texas in 1980. Uh, there were there were quite a few of them, but I, you know, I go through and try to work them and see if I could find missing persons listings for any of these. And and uh I solved a few cases uh, by matching up, you know, uh, missing persons listings to to uh, Doe listings, and and so you know, with each success, you're you're like, oh wow, this is you know, this is exciting. I can, mm -hmm. you know, I'm able to, you know, have a hand in resolving these. So, um, so yeah, I just get, and then eventually my artistic skills came into play because I had seen. In, in researching these cases, I became aware of, you know, that some of these facial reconstruction drawings that the law enforcement agencies put out are not that good a quality. And I, I have artistic skills, so I decided to start doing facial reconstruction drawings myself. And, and now, um, at first, I didn't really have a good handle on the computer software, but with practice, I eventually started getting better with the software. And and learning techniques and different, you know, developing my own little uh, um, set of techniques to 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 do these and and uh, people people were sharing them on their Facebook page and yeah, I was getting a lot of good positive feedback out of them and so you know that was that was just more reinforcement to keep doing it. Right, and so the process you kind of started drawing first and then you moved into the more computer side no, of things? No, this was all on computer. I, I, oh, it was? I okay. It was a, um, you know, Vice Media did a video where I was... I was, I was just going to mention that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a guy in Philadelphia who, uh, the man had been rummaging for scrap metal in an in a abandoned hotel. It was a closed-down hotel that was... That was uh, he had gotten inside and uh, was rummaging for scrap metal and cut himself real badly and bled to death inside the inside the hotel. And they found his body uh, not long after he died, so he wasn't decomposed. But they had this postmortem photo of him on the name of system. And then, you know, along with the listing of him, they had a drawing. And I looked at the drawing and said, that, that's a terrible drawing. That's, that's uh, you know, that doesn't look like him. And I know if I could just take put his his uh, corner photo in the in Corel photo paint and you know put open eyes on him and and uh, the description said he was wearing a Philadelphia Eagles jersey so I found a picture of a Philadelphia Eagles jersey online and put that on him and uh, you know it wasn't a whole lot of work I just you know straightened his mouth out and put the open eyes on him and put the G jersey on him and then put it online and Somebody says, "Oh, that that's great. That's a lot better than the official one." Uh, and eventually, it, it ended up being put on the uh, on Doe Network and on a couple of uh, missing persons sites. So, uh, and then eventually, the Doe Network people came to me and said, "Hey, we have a few more that that one. You know, do you think you could uh, yeah do uh, do reconstructions of these cases?" And so, I did about ten of those and. Uh, you know, eventually I kept, uh, you know, if I find a 
an image of a doe online, I'd say, okay, I'll take that and do my own reconstruction. And at first, you know, the quality of these weren't real good at first, but as I learned various ways to to do things efficiently and to uh, different different tools and techniques with the with the Corel Photo Paint software, I started learning how to do things uh, much better and much more efficiently and and uh, and so my my uh, the quality of my images started improving mm -hmm. significantly and so I just kept doing them. I've probably done about 200 of them now. I was doing age progressions as well for a while, but I found that you know each time I'd put out an age progression, I'd have about 20 people contact me on Facebook saying, you know, my my sister, my mother, my you know brothers been missing for 20, 30 years. Can you do a age progression for me too? And I was like, oh, geez, I don't yeah. have the time. To, I yeah. can't have the time to fulfill everybody's requests, and I don't really want to uh, pick and choose arbitrarily who's I'm gonna honor and who's I'm going to turn down because that that would create a whole lot of you know uncomfortable situations so oh sure yeah, I, yeah I just said to myself never mind I, I won't do age progressions anymore mm -hmm. I'll just do the you know the dough the dough reconstructions and that's what I've been doing for the last uh, several years now just just uh just dough drawings not not age progressions mm -hmm. so the actual I mean most okay so all of the doe photos that you eventually end up putting online. So are those, so it's like a very specific layout for the image. I mean, it's like the person looks alive, which is obviously the goal. Yeah. Um, so well, is this yeah. like your signature? Like this is your, like that's if you kind of become my signature, I'm yeah. my, you know, the objective is to try to make it so visually appealing that people want to fit, share it on their Facebook page and, and share the story. And then the story becomes publicized. So, um, you know, a lot of these cases, they'll create a, a depiction of a facial structure or, you know, they have these CAT scan images that are, that are kind of gray and very generic looking and don't have any visual appeal. And, you know, right. while they might be technically accurate depictions of the way a person's head is shaped, uh, it doesn't draw in the attention. People don't, you know, it doesn't captivate the attention. So, um, so my objective here is, you know, create, you know, a really nice image that that has a nice background. A lot of times, I'll put a background in it that that depicts the the area they were found. If somebody was found in North Carolina, I'll do an Appalachian background. Um, you know, if they were found in a, like, you know, there was one I did a, like the guy died in Brooklyn, so I used the Brooklyn Bridge as a, as a backdrop. Uh, the, you know, there was, I try to complete the image such that, you know, when people see that, they say, oh, wow, that's a nice image. And then, and then there's a story that goes along with it and says, oh, interesting story. If all you have is this uh, little CAT scan, gray colored generic depiction of a, of a facial shape, you know, people just pass it right over as they see it on their Facebook feed. So, mm -hmm. you know, the story doesn't get around. It's so. true. Yeah. Well, and I, what I think is so interesting too, I mean, it's become like a signature in the true crime community to see these depictions <laughs> of these people alive. I mean, it's like, yeah. I literally was scrolling through Instagram today and one of them popped up. I was like, oh my gosh, it's like you see them everywhere. So, I mean, like what, what you're doing is so great. I mean, it really is. And, you know, along with that comes, you know, media attention. You, have, you know, we had Vice Media contact me and Crime Watch Daily contacted me. And I did a CNN interview and, a, you know, the local news in Los Angeles did a little, uh, you know, 30 or you know, like a 45 second uh, news clip of uh you know, um, of a case that I was working on in, in L.A. So um, that's, you know, mm -hmm. you know, with each little uh, bit of publicity, there more comes along. So mm -hmm. it's does really it feel cool. does it feel a little surreal? Yeah, or have does, you gotten because you I've <laughs> always just been kind of anonymous. I don't, uh, you know, I don't stick my head out. I don't try to draw attention to myself, but um 
I'm happy to get the attention on the on the subject. You know, the whole idea is to get these cases out and hopefully someone will recognize the, you know, the image as someone they used to know who was, you know, who might be missing. So, you know, and most of these people don't have missing persons reports or they would have been identified a long time ago. So, you know, for whatever reason, you know, missing persons reports don't get filed on these people and, and you know, they go decades and, you know, there's no way of connecting the person to the to the doe case so mm -hmm. um that's you know that's how <laughs> yeah I, I try to get the public attention on these things and that's how i do it so can we talk about some of the more recent cases that have had updates like within the last year one yeah, that sure. like sticks out in my head was the racine county jane doe oh um, yeah and that was an interesting case because that, I, this was back in about 2012, I think, 2011, 2012, I was working on that case, trying to find uh, missing persons who would fit, you know, her description or who looked like her. And I had come across a case of a 14-year-old girl from, um, from Holland, Michigan, uh, from west the west side of the state of Michigan. Uh, she, her name was Andrea Bowman. And when I looked at her photo, I was certain that she was Racine Jane Doe. And, mm -hmm. and, and as it turned out, she was adopted. The detective told me she was adopted and they, they're having trouble trying to locate her birth mother, her natural mother, and they don't have DNA on her, so they can't do any comparison. They didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't have any uh, dental records. And I think they had maybe a thumbprint that they thought was hers, but they weren't certain of that. So, um, so they set out to locate her biological mother. And when they did, her mother was flabbergasted that, you know, the whole, that the girl that she had given up for adoption, who, who she, she had trusted was, uh, um, she had trusted was put into a safe, you know, family situation. As it turned mm -hmm. out that she disappeared at 14 years old. Turned out she never, she wasn't Racine Jane Doe, obviously, but but uh, she contacted me and we became friends and I traveled to Michigan four times along with her mm -hmm. to try to gather information on the on the case. And what we learned was that the adopted father was a convicted sex offender who had spent five years in prison for trying to rape a 18 year old girl at gunpoint. Oh, my gosh. And, and so this was the the man who had adopted my friend's daughter. Mm hmm. And then, lo and behold, the daughter disappears at 14 years old. So um, we, we've been certain for for years, We, you know, she's been pounding her fist on the table and she has a Facebook page out and she's been screaming from the rooftops, this guy is responsible for her disappearance and calling him out publicly and, you know, saying, mm -hmm. go ahead and sue me because uh, he wouldn't dare sue me because, you know, I'm <laughs> telling the truth. Right, right. <laughs> and, wow. And so, you know, she was... Uh, basically just daring him to sue her and you know if he was ever to sue her then then he'd have to be deposed and he wouldn't want to do that so so she's been screaming from the rooftops about this and just uh, a couple of months ago uh the news broke dennis bowman was the name of the adopted father he was arrested for a 1980 murder in virginia of a wife of a navy man and oh my gosh. 40 years ago, or 40 years after the murder, they finally caught up to him. <laughs> and, and so oh. it's like, see, I told you. Right. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my so, gosh. So, uh, yeah, that's been an exciting uh, journey going going through that. And now we have uh, Dateline wants to do the story. And um, we've been contacted by the Dateline producers and going to have Keith Morrison you know, telling the whole story of Andrea. Oh my Bowman. gosh, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the goal to have Keith yeah, yeah. to I tell mean, the story. The that's, time, that's, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that does get... DNA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Oh, I love it. But she ran away. But... Yeah. Oh, he's the best. Oh, she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he really is the best, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I mean, that's great. So, I mean, Let's see what else. 
So yeah. Anyway, that that's kind of yeah. You started mm -hmm. with the, the Racine Jane Doe story, and it kind of you know that's that story oh, yeah. was what led to me meeting Kathy, my friend Kathy, and learning about the whole Andrea Bowman story, and mm -hmm. and spending uh, you know I've probably been work you know helping Kathy out with that, and she's she's paid for my uh, you know my fare to Michigan four times. We've traveled to Michigan four times to attend missing persons conventions and to meet with people who contact the Facebook page that she has. And mm -hmm. we've met a lot of people who used to know Andrea in high school and, and uh, people who were neighbors of the Bowman's people who knew the Bowman's and, you know, this, <laughs> this story has taken a whole lot of very strange and yeah. uh, hooks and turns. That's, I mean, but that's so interesting too, that it's like you got completely like, enveloped in the case you know it's like it 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 consumes you i find yeah. <laughs> a little bit fortunately you know, i mean at the time i was you know caring for my mother and so if if she wanted to go to michigan i'd have to call my sisters from oregon and say can you come down for a for a few days and take care of mom while while yeah. I was in michigan yeah. to this missing persons convention so you know this has been something that's you know caught a lot of my focus and you know mm -hmm. a lot of my uh a lot of my interests so you know it's not just unidentified decedent cases that i've uh, been involved in this missing person this, this specific missing persons case that right that i've uh kind of gotten involved in and it's now starting to uh, all um come full circle mm -hmm. wow that's so interesting I can't get over the dateline thing. That's awesome <laughs> with that. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, so do you still kind of hang out on web sleuths? You're kind of well, still now on I'm there? Well, the DNA Doe project. Uh, I last year was invited to, uh, to join them. Uh, they actually contacted me on one of their cases. They had come up with a candidate uh, or an identity for a case they were working on. They called it Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. And they had this, uh, you know, possible identity of, of Sheep's Flat Jane Doe. And they had a photo of her from high school. And they contacted me and said, you know, you're good with faces. Can you tell me if if you think this woman is Sheep's Flat Jane Doe? And mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, it certainly looks like her. You know, all the, <laughs> everything's consistent. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I told them that and they said, well, you know, can you sign a non-disclosure agreement? Because, uh, you know, we don't, we want all of anybody who we give information to, to sign a non-disclosure agreement. And so I did that. And then once I signed the non-disclosure agreement, I was a member of the, you know, I was a volunteer for their group then. And they then started having, letting me work on some of the cases they were working on. So. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's so, so cool. I, yeah. So that's what I've been doing for the last year or so i've spent a lot less time on web sleuths lately because you know all my spare time now now that i'm working also i work a 40 hour week so you know I, in my spare time uh usually it's you know building family trees on ancestry for um for you know these dna doe project cases mm -hmm. wow wow so let's see So with the DNA Doe Project, so can you can you tell us a little bit about that? I know it's been around for a while now, right? Well, it hasn't been around for that long. It's only been around about a year and a half. But they, uh, um, the DNA Doe Project is run by two women, uh, Colleen Fitzpatrick and Margaret Press. And they had been insisting for a long time that these genealogy databases could be used to solve a lot of these intractable doe cases and you know she, a lot of people were doubtful at first but uh they took on a couple of cases one of them being this case called the buckskin girl that everybody you know it was a pretty high profile case that nobody was able to solve and and they got the dna into jedmatch they they created the dna profile for buckskin girl and stuck it in jedmatch and with four and within four hours they came up with a name for it. wow and, and so everybody was surprised. Oh, wow, this is, uh, you know, this actually works. So 
And then there was another case, a, um, a man who had committed suicide, an elderly man, and uh, he was living under a false identity. And, and, uh, oh, and, is that Joseph? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Chandler, I think he was. Yes, Chandler, yeah. Uh, is actually, his real name was actually Nichols, or Nick, yeah, I think his last name was Nichols, but, mm -hmm. um, but that was one of their first cases, and that took a lot longer than the Buckskin Girl case, but eventually they solved that one too. So, uh, and then they took on a um, another case that was kind of high profile, a guy who uh, committed suicide in a motel and was had checked in under the uh, um, false identity of Lyle Stevick, and um, they worked on his case and came up with an identity for him as well, but. Um, his family has requested anonymity, so they've never re released his oh. name to the public. But they have released that they have, you know, they have identified him, and his family's been notified. Mm -hmm. Wow! So, so uh, I don't remember the exact count because it's <laughs> it's constantly uh, ticking up. But uh, we must have about twenty twenty five cases now that we've solved in just uh, just the year and a half that we've been in business. Wow. I, I mean, like that, that like speaks like, so it speaks volumes about like what you guys are doing, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's exciting because a lot of these cases are cases I've been, you know, pounding my head on, you know, Buckskin Girl was one of them. I've, you know, I don't know how many high school yearbooks I've looked at through, you know, the states of Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, I've gone, you know, through just about every yearbook in classmates.com for, you know, all along the major highways that that cross through those states. And then I got a clue that she might might be from uh, the mid mid Texas area. So I started going through yearbooks in, in the Dallas area. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, <laughs> I spent a lot of time going through yearbooks trying to find, uh, you know, somebody who looked like Buckskin Girl. I came up with a few good possibilities but none of them ever turned out to be her and then then dna dope project takes on her case and, and figures it out in four hours <laughs> yeah i mean that's well, crazy though like the fact that it was only four hours <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah i mean they, they got lucky with the dna when they came up with a list of people who were related to her they came up with a uh i think it was a first cousin once removed so i mean it was like oh wow you know, right there in her family so right um, you know, you, you, when you have a first cousin once removed, it's it's a, it's easy to build a family tree on that person because, um, you know, inf so much information is available on people now. Uh, you know, you can pretty much build a family tree on anybody or anybody in the United States, that is, because anybody, everybody's online. And, yeah. and now you have Ancestry.com where, you know, census documents are available now so you can go back to the you know 1700s and 1800s and there's a case i'm working on right now for the dna doe project it's a case out of of a hispanic woman and uh um and she she was found in in ventura county california she was uh found in the she had been murdered in her body she was five months pregnant and she her body was left in the parking lot of a high school near oh. Thousand Oaks, it was like Westlake Village High School near Thousand Oaks, and uh, this was 1980, and they, they've caught the murderer, they know who the murderer is, but he says he picked her up hitching, hitchhiking up near Visalia, California, so, um, so we've been working the, we are her match list, and the match list, because we're dealing with a Hispanic woman, the, the, Hispanic population isn't as well represented in the Jed match system as other, you know, as the Caucasian um, people. The um, the the matches that we're getting are about maybe third, fourth, fifth cousin level, mm -hmm. which uh, our best match was about a third cousin, and we were, were never able to connect that third cousin person to any other of our matches. Probably because somewhere in her family there was a a parent that you're not expecting to be the parent. You know, a lot of times you you know somebody's on on record as being a father of a, a person, and when in fact somebody else is the father, and and so when you run into oh, a wow. situation like that, you hit a dead end on the on the family tree. 
So how uh, so how often would you say that happens? Just out of curiosity. Oh, it happens quite a bit. And another thing you, that causes a lot of problems is uh, as you go through these isolated communities, uh, all a lot of our ancestry goes back to uh, Mexico, and uh, specifically north northeastern Mexico, uh, the state of Nuevo León, and you know, when you have all these little ranches that are kind of far apart and tight, you know, they're tightly knit within their community, but they don't get out of their community. You get a lot of intermarriage between relatives. So, you know, the family tree has become quite tangled up, you know, when you have, uh, like, for example, a very, one of our very common surnames in our, in our group of relatives from that part of, we, we have several clusters of of relatives, but our our northeastern Mexico cluster is, you know, everybody's either Garza or Cantu or Trevino or, uh, you know, there's a few surnames that, mm -hmm. that just keep showing up because, you know, Cantus are marrying Cantus and Garzas are marrying Garzas. And, <laughs> and yeah. so everybody in that whole cluster has that surname. So, um, so, and it actually magnifies the, the, estimated relationship it you know somebody may look, appear to be a third cousin when in fact they're a fifth or sixth cousin because you know the dna keeps circulating through mm -hmm. the, through the family tree the same bands of dna because of intermarriage between you know second and third cousins so i mean even if they don't realize they're cousins a lot of times you know it, it's inevitable that you're going to have marriages between between uh cousins because of the nature of the community mm -hmm. it's just uh you know isolated and low population and and uh kind of tight knit so um or that that creates quite a problem but but yeah that's uh well i've been working on that case for about a year now so mm -hmm. you know that's uh and that was the Ven ventura yeah yeah the ventura mm -hmm. jane doe and that's um <laughs> we probably have about 50,000 names in the family tree, but, uh, you know, we have about four or five really distinctive geographical groupings. And in addition to our northern, northeastern Mexico group, we also have a group that's uh, northern New Mexico in the United States, people whose uh, families go back to the 1850s, 1750s in mm. northern New Mexico, even before New Mexico was a state. Um, we're finding common relatives, common ancestors of our matches are all kind of linking up, you know, in the 1850s or the 1750s in northeast, or excuse me, northern New Mexico, southern Colorado. So, uh, so that's another cluster of people we're trying to, you know, deal with the uh, old census documents and old birth notices and you know that's another interesting thing with a, with a Mexican ancestry. You have to be able to read Spanish because everything, every birth, every marriage, every death was recorded in a little civil registry office and in a little handwritten uh, passage. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a whole bo whole books full of dating back to the 1600s. In some cases, uh, all the births and marriages and deaths are all recorded in these civil registry books and. You can read through them and it identifies the parents and then a lot of times it identifies the grandparents as well. Uh, and you can go through and, you know, really build very detailed family trees based on the information you find in these little civil registry books. Right, right. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's just so crazy how many, like, it, it's like you're going down a rabbit hole with this. I mean, it's like fascinating. <laughs> it's so interesting. Yeah, I mean, I wish we could get closer, you know, closer matches than third cousin level matches. Right. You know, right. the as I said, our closest match is third cousin level, but that one person, we can't find the common ancestor on that one person because um, that has to be so. You know, we have the true family too. tree built out six or seven yeah. generations in all directions and it doesn't link up with any of our other um and any of our other uh matches so you know you, you figure it's got to be somewhere in there that there was a father who wasn't <laughs> was never uh mm -hmm. on record as being the father 
Right. Wow. So let's, um, let's see here. I had one. Oh, I also wanted to ask you, um, about orange socks. Was that also solved this last year? Uh, yeah, it was solved last. DNA Doe Project worked that case, but what mm -hmm. happened was uh, a call came into the law enforcement agency uh, based on some uh, media publicity on the case. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, her sister actually saw the media publicity and, and the drawing and actually called in the law enforcement agency at the time we had been working the case. So they came to us and said, hey, we have a candidate. Uh, somebody had called in and believes that this is her sister. And can you, you know, run her DNA and against the the kid yeah. Yeah, Jed match? And they came back. Yeah, that that did turn out to be, you know, her sister. So um, we did the confirmation, but we didn't actually ourselves come up with the identity. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. OK. I just I had remembered um I remembered that was a big big one amongst the true crime community for a long time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the orange socks that just like well, you know, it was I, a Henry Lee Lucas case that was as you well, recall yeah. orange socks was the case on which Henry Lee Lucas was sentenced to death and then George, uh, gov then governor George Bush commuted the sentence because it became apparent that Henry Lee Lucas was falsely confessing to a whole lot of uh, murders and they decided well you know we're not absolutely certain that this conviction is can be you know a, a reliable conviction and they went ahead and mm -hmm. commuted his, his sentence to life in prison but um but it was on that case that he was convicted so um i mean i don't know if i believe that he actually killed orange socks or not but you know it's kind of doubtful but mm -hmm. um but yeah, I think it was because of Henry Lee Lucas and his notoriety that that the Orange Sox case also uh, um, became well known. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember hearing about the Orange Sox case even long before I was into doing, uh, you know, doe cases. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even yeah, even before I started getting into this, I, I remember hearing about the Orange Sox case. So I have, I also have a question. Okay. So your these sketches that you're doing or is that what you call them sketches or digital yeah, renderings? Yeah, uh, depictions. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sketch yeah. kind of implies, you know, a pencil in your hand and a right. paper, right? So I don't like to use the word sketch cuz you know that <laughs> Right. Sketch, yeah, that's <laughs> you know doesn't seem to fit to doing these things on computer with a you know with a Corel photo paint and a mm -hmm. mouse in hand. Um, but, so are you, yeah. so you're working with um, post-mortem photos? Yeah, or s photos of skulls. Photos and that's what I was going to ask. Can you photos. do this with skulls and like bones? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can take a photo of a skull. If, you know, if I have a really good photo of a skull, I can build a face around it and I have enough uh, knowledge of anatomy. I took anatomy in college and I, you know, I have a fairly good knowledge of how muscle, where muscles contact the skull or, you know, where, how, where the contact points of the muscles are. So, um, and, you know, how ju just a kind of a sense of how thick they are. A lot of people, a lot of the experts use these tissue depth markers, but I, I just kind of go by kind of a gut feel of, you know, how thick a per I think a person's tissue is at a certain point on the yeah uh, on the skull so and i think we all watched forensic files with them doing mm -hmm. the clay renderings on you know yeah the... with the little eraser you know you cut little yep. pieces of yep. eraser and stick them out there i, I don't do any of that because <laughs> it's uh you know i don't have all the equipment to do that first of right. all and I, don't, I don't do sculptures so usually it's just a direct photo of a uh, skull and i can build a face around it and i I think I know enough about muscles and how they attach to be able to you know, cr accurately depict how they, you know, how the face builds around the skull. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is, I mean, I'm like, I'm literally scrolling through your Facebook right now, looking at the different <laughs> ones you've done. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, like, I am just like, I'm blown away by it. Like, 
Yeah, that Linda Pagano one was, uh, I, I am kind of, I was amazed myself at how close that Linda Pagano case came to. I mean, like all of them, though, the ones that have been identified, it is mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can't say I hit the mark every time. There were a couple that were, that, you know, were off, but I, I think I've, uh, you know, more often than not, I'm able to come up with a reasonably close depiction of what they what they looked like in life. Right. Whether I'm working from a skull or whether I'm working from, you know, a, the most difficult ones to work work from are either bodies that are burnt or uh, bodies that have been pulled out of water mm -hmm. uh, are the most difficult because, you know, it's really difficult to get a sense of the facial structure from from a bloated body pulled out of a river or something. And so, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So how would you work with something like that? Like, let's say they're like, can you help us? Actually, that was one of the cases that where I've actually had somebody recognize one of my drawings as somebody they knew, uh, was, uh, there, there are three such cases. Uh, this was a case out of Spokane and the, this was a homeless man who had, I don't know what he'd fallen in the river or died in the river. And, and his body was in the river for several days, maybe a week, and was in very bad condition when they pulled it out and they showed it to me and said, you know, do you think you can do something with this, uh, you know, this photo? And I said, well, I don't know, it's in pretty bad shape, but I'll give it a try. And so, uh, you know, I, I could see the man had a big long beard and he had gray hair and he was, um, so I, you know, developed a face on it and showed him wearing the clothes that he was found in. I, depicted the clothes he was found in and it was a t-shirt with a little logo on the uh, on the breast there mm -hmm. and uh and they put it out on the news and within a day the homeless shelter called up and said oh i know who that is that's uh donald Knighton." and uh so yeah sure enough it was and you know when you compare the side by side i he his face wasn't as you know, I depicted him a little you know, more fat in the face, uh, more mm -hmm. more fleshy in the face, but uh, um, but you know, it was close enough, I guess, that the person right. who, I was, who I was right. Depicting, I, well, it must have been pretty close that they were able to yeah. figure it out. Yeah, I mean, know? I look at it and say, well, you know, it wasn't real close, but but it was close enough that somebody recognized it, and that's what matters. So, right. Do you find yourself being a perfectionist with this oh, in the God. end? And a lot of times, you know, I'll finish something and think it looks good at, at a certain point, and then I'll come back to it a couple of days later and go, oh, no, I, that, you know, it still doesn't look right. I need to do more work on it. And I've done that over and over on all my cases. And as I develop my, my uh, capability with the software and learn some new little technique, then I have to go back to all the ones I've done before and redo them again. So, right. so uh, you know, I... You know, what started off as kind of a, you know, not so great depiction, you know, now using my own skill set now, I'm able to create, in a lot of cases, almost a lifelike depiction. So, you know, most of these ones I've done have probably been redone, you know, four or five times. Sometimes some of these cases, it's like... <laughs> The ones I'm more interested in, like Walker County Jane Doe, I've probably redone probably 20 times mm -hmm. uh, over the years, you know, starting with a really crude version. But, uh, you know, eventually now the the most recent version that I've done on her almost looks like a photo. Mm -hmm. Would you say Would you that that's one of your, like, your passion case? Like, Yeah, and, and any case involving a, a teenager... Mm -hmm. you know, a teenage boy or a teenage girl, it doesn't matter. But, it, you know, you, the the thought is that, you know, when when you have an old case of a, an elderly person, the, the, the likelihood of somebody still being alive who recognizes them is less than it would be if, you know, you have a child. You, the child's going to probably have siblings. If not, their parents are still alive. The, the person's going to have siblings who are still alive and probably wondering what happened to them. So... Um, which, you know, was the case with Tammy Jo Alexander. She had a sister in Florida who who had assumed because of their uh, dysfunctional family circumstances 
just figured she'd ran away and decided not to come back when in fact she'd been murdered up in upstate New York. Mm-hmm. So, you know, she never did end up on a missing persons listing up until 2014 when her friend from high school decided to file a missing persons report. So, um, so yeah, this Walker County Jane Doe case is probably a similar situation. You, you know, there's, she had to have had friends who, <laughs> Who are wondering? Oh, yeah, I haven't seen my friends since high school. I wonder mm-hmm. what you know what happened to her, and start looking around online and not finding anything on them online. So, right, that's uh, you know, generally with most people, you can find some sort of a digital digital trace on them. So, um, right, right, you know, you can find a Facebook page or a you know Spokeo. You go on Spokeo or one of these little people search sites, and you can. Mm-hmm find information on just about anybody you know because you know as you go through life in the digital age you you know information your information contact information ends up being accumulated and and available on these sites right right that's so you know it's so interesting to me that family members like a lot of these i mean would you say the majority of the does that you're working with and the ones that have been identified for the most part did not have a missing person out on them or a missing person. Uh, particularly with these cases that remain unsolved. Uh, there have been enough people working these cases now that anybody who's on a missing persons list has been run against the, the unidentified decedent cases, mm-hmm. you know, a hundred times over. Sure. You know, so, you know, all the low hanging fruit has been already picked and the ones that remain are these, these cases like, you know, where, you know, a missing persons report was never filed or in some instances, a missing persons report was filed, but got closed for some reason, as is the case now with this, uh, this woman lime lady, uh, that we just, uh, just resolved, uh, uh, Tamara, um, Tamara Tiger is her name. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, as they explained in the in the news conference, that that there was a missing persons report on her, but it got closed because uh, somebody was using her ident- or using her identification or, or claiming to be her, and she got pulled over, and a woman got pulled over in Ohio with uh, using her ident- identity, and so they mistakenly thought she was the missing woman, and and closed the case. Mm, so, wow. Um, so yeah, this, uh, when in fact, yeah, the woman was murdered and they've been, they were trying to identify her, but, um, that's, you no, know, yeah. things happen. Yeah. Or, or a lot of times, you know, when you have adults who do have a history of, of wandering off or, you know, going off on their own law enforcement agencies are very reluctant to even accept a missing persons report, they'll say, well, you know, this person runs off all the time. There's mm-hmm. you know, it's probably what they did this time. And so, you know, if a family member will show up at a law enforcement agency and say, you know, no, <laughs> this yeah. person does, that, that doesn't behave like that. That's not consistent with uh, who, who this person is. They wouldn't do, they wouldn't just leave and not, not come back. Right, but, right. You know, right. The law enforcement agencies a lot of times say, "Well, that's probably what happened." When they they refuse to take the report, so that's happened on a few instances as well. Mm-hmm. So, do you mm-hmm. feel like? Um, I mean, obviously, you've been doing this for a while now. Do you feel like the climate is starting to kind of change in law enforcement when it comes to unidentified victims? Yeah, or do you a few think... states are passing laws now that. Uh, you know, if a person's missing for more than 30 days, that they need to be put into the uh, the NamUs system, National Missing and Unidentified Person System. Mm-hmm. Oklahoma just came up with a uh, just passed a law recently uh, called Francine's Law. It's actually one of the cases I was involved in uh, in uh, the resolution of um, was a woman named Francine Frost, but uh, but her family pressed the Oklahoma State Legislature to pass Francine's law, which requires that, you know, if a person, if an unidentified body case is 
unresolved for 30 days, it has to be put into the name of the system. As I said, missing persons cases earlier, but I meant unidentified bodies mm -hmm. cases. Right. So you can't just let a unidentified remains case go unreported. You know, for more than 30 days, it has to be put into the name of the system. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how does the DNA Doe Project, I guess, find their cases that they're going? Uh, I mean, is it like just a this one's interesting, we're going to do this? Or is it, is there well, a process? You know, a lot of the law enforcement agencies are reaching out to us. So in most cases, that's, um, you know, they, the law enforcement agencies see, see a case get solved on, on the media and they mm -hmm. say, well, well, I have this case. And so, you know, maybe, you know, <laughs> we can get them to work our case. That's, that's how most of the cases are initiated. But okay. there are a few where, you know, interesting cases that, that where we've reached out to the law enforcement agency and said, Hey, you know, we'd love to work your case. If, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, get a DNA profile on, on your case, we can probably, uh, solve it using, using mm -hmm. our methodology. Mm -hmm. Wow. So for the most part, is it like cold cases? You guys are working, or are there some like yeah, most today's? Of the cases we in the, we work are decades old, but you know there's a there's a few of them that uh, I think one we just solved uh, or just announced a couple of days ago uh, was a man whose body was just found a couple of years ago, and then and you know after a couple of years of trying, they decided to come to us. So I mean that was a recent case, and there was a case out of Philadelphia of a woman who had fallen out of the back of a a pickup truck in the the driver left the scene. Uh, and so, uh, we've, we haven't announced her name, but we have come up with her identity and, and that was only a couple of years ago that this happened. So, mm -hmm. but most of our cases are, you know, date back to the, you know, the seventies and eighties. Mm -hmm. We had one case that, that was just announced, uh, about a month ago it was a, a man who had been, murdered in 1913 i believe it was or 1916 and his body was found in a cave in 19 oh yes the cave guy yeah. yeah and as it turned out you know his body was uh you know by the time his id was figured out he was you know 103 years ago that it 103 years before wow but, <laughs> um, 100, 103 years later that they finally came up with his name so uh yeah, that was, you know, the, you know, we have cases that are 100 years old. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, wow. But most of these cases date back, you know, the 70s and 80s, maybe the 90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, these cases that the agencies have been working on and just been un unable to solve. And, you know, if we can get a good DNA profile on them and, get them into gen match chances are pretty good that we'll find a close enough relative or a list of relatives that are close enough that we can build family trees on them and find where they intersect. Mm -hmm. So is there, um, what would you say has been, and I don't know if you can tell me this, what would you say has been the most interesting case you've worked on that has just like, like, gotcha. Like, and, <laughs> And um, how do how do you feel like was it resolved or not? Like, what would you say? It, like, I know we had talked about the one case being your um, like passion one, but is there one that is just like racking your brain and you're like, what's going on with this? Oh, there. Well, there. Yeah, there are a bunch of there are several cases like like the uh, the Sumter. There's a Sumter, South Carolina couple. There's two. Uh, a young couple was found murdered in 1976 and they've never been able to identify either of them uh their bodies were found inside a dirt road in north in south carolina and uh and they're just a young couple probably in their early 20s mm -hmm. um you know nobody knows who they were and that's that's been a big uh dna Doe project is has is trying to get a profile on them now, but mm -hmm. we haven't come up with a, a, a profile for them yet, but I mean, it's still working its way through the labs. Mm -hmm. So, 
who knows whether we'll be able to get a good profile on them because it is an old case and you know with these old cases the dna becomes degraded and it's more difficult to compile a you know mm -hmm. a good profile that you can put into gen match but but sure. uh yeah that's uh that's one case that you know that i'd really <laughs> love to see solved and yeah and, uh, and get their identities mm -hmm. well very interesting hmm. <laughs> So as far as like working with the DNA Doe project, so, oh, I had my question and it just left my brain. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens a it's lot. Okay. You can cut, it, you can cut the uh, pause out. <laughs> um, so when working with the DNA Doe project, what is one thing you really want people to know about the project itself? Well, we we're all volunteers nobody gets paid for what we do uh one thing we've been really pressing and you know trying to get people to do is that if you've taken a dna test with a company such as ancestry or with uh 23andme you know there's various services out there that do dna tests and you know you can um you know send your saliva in a vial and they'll give you a you know a big uh, profile but um, if, if you've taken one of those tests we ask that you download your kit to GEDmatch because that's where you know the it's all free it doesn't it's free of charge but it's a kind of a uh, open source um, DNA database that that allows um, allows us to to put our cases in there the the uh, the companies like Ancestry and Twenty Three and Me don't allow allow their databases to be used for you know law enforcement agencies or by you know the people doing uh, doe cases. So mm -hmm. so we have to rely on people putting we, we we need a robust database in order to um, to do what we do. And so we I'm just urging anybody out there who you know, if you've taken a test with Ancestry, please download it to GEDmatch. And there's a an opt-in process where you have to affirmatively state that uh, yes, I'm allowing my kit to be used for used by law enforcement for mm -hmm. uh, researching either uh, cold case homicide cases or or unidentified decedent cases. So, uh, yeah, please, if you've taken the test, please download it to. Jed match and please opt in. Mm -hmm. Man, I wish they had an option where you could just like submit your DNA for that. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like here you can have it for that. I don't want to know anything else. Well, so. <laughs> it used to be that way, but it, I guess a lot of people in the you know, genealogy community got all up in arms about, you know, I didn't, I didn't uh, give permission for my kit to be used for that purpose, and a lot of people raised a big fuss about it and mm -hmm. and uh at the time well actually Jed Match is owned by a corporate entity now but but at the time it was just two guys who you know were running the company out of a residence in Florida mm -hmm. you know they're just a couple of private guys and they didn't have the resources to defend themselves in court and you know so you know when people started raising a big fuss about um you know you, you shouldn't be letting law enforcement you know access our kits uh right you know the the law enforcement is perfectly within their rights to do it because you know there's you know supreme court precedent that that affirms their right to do that but um but nevertheless the owners were leery about getting into a whole lot of litigation over uh you know over that issue so oh sure yeah so they went ahead and put in place this opt-in opt-out system and then Eventually, it became opt out by default, and then you had to go in and actually state, yeah, yeah, I want to opt in. And you know, if it's somebody who has died since they put their kid in Jed Match, they're permanently opted out because they don't have the ability to go in and and opt their kid in anymore if they're if they're deceased now. So, right. Um, and I always and I took the actual like DNA profiles from those I feel like it's no different than if you're going to submit it it's no different than leaving like 
a cup that you've drank off of on a table. Like it's you're gonna or put it out there. It's like putting a picture on your Facebook page. Yeah. Police have free right to go to your Facebook page if you have something on your Facebook page that incriminates somebody. Um not necessarily you, but maybe somebody else. You see two people standing together in a photo that you put on your Facebook page and you know the that has some meaning to a law enforcement agency then you know has some implication on a case then law enforcement is perfectly within their rights to take that photo and use it um you know even though you didn't give them permission to take it off your your facebook page it's public information and the uh, supreme court has affirmed that it's called the uh um the third party doctrine it was uh i think a 1976 supreme court case that says once you put your information out in the public it's uh you know, police have every right to take it and use it for whatever they want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you have no say in, you know, if you don't want them to to use it, then don't put it out there in, in public. Right. So, you know, it's it's well established, but nevertheless, the the people at Jedmatch didn't have the means to to really uh, try to fight that point. Mm-hmm. So you're not, and I think I already know the answer to this, but you're not able to talk about any of the cases you guys are working on right now? No, well, I, yeah, the, the, there, yeah I can talk about certain things, but not like <laughs> identities of our matches or, you know, where we are, mm -hmm. you know, how, whether we're close to an identity on a certain case or whether we, mm -hmm. you know, there's something that hasn't been announced that we, we can't, uh, discuss that but you know maybe you know the process or mm -hmm. or you know the, the cases we're working on most of them are you know have been publicized so i you know i can talk about that but you know as for as i said the names of the matches or or mm -hmm. the progress on the case i can't say anything about that right right hmm so this might be a weird question would you say that you've worked on every case that you've wanted to work on? Or is there some case out there that you're like, yeah, I want to, I want to try this. Well, it, you know, the, the volunteers at DNA Doe Project, I think there are about 50 of us. And, and so, you know, when, when a case becomes available for research or, you know, when the kit gets loaded into Jed match, then, then they, uh, you know, pull people into a group and say, okay, we'll pick these certain people and they can work on that case. So, you know, you can, you can say to them, I want to work on this case, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get picked for it. So, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I've got my hands full with this, uh, Ventura County Jane Doe case. I've been working on it for like a year now. Yeah. Uh, so I haven't really had a whole lot of time to work on other cases. I have worked on a few other cases. I did I did do a little work on the uh, on the Lime Lady case, but you know we had that solved within a day and a half. So um, um, that you know <laughs> that was pretty brief. Yeah, you know, and I was back to the Ventura case again. But and there's a few others that I'm actually members of the group. But you know be, when I have time to sit down and work these cases, it's usually the Ventura Jane Doe case that I that I go to. Mm -hmm. I mean I'm, I can see the activity on, on the, a few other cases that I'm, you know, included in the group, but mo very little of my time is actually spent building trees on those other cases. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can see what they're doing on the cases, what the, the more act the people who are actively working those cases can, are doing, I can see what they're doing, but, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's other cases that I, in a few instances where there was a case I wanted to be involved in and, you know, they said, well, no, we've already got our team assembled. So, which is fine. Wow. I, you know, like <laughs> right. Like, right. So, so are all the renderings out there, those are all done by you, the ones with the backgrounds and. Yeah. Anything with the, usually the color images with the backgrounds are, are mine. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, and a lot of times uh, national center for missing exploited uh, children will have an image that, that they want. They want you know that to be the image mm -hmm. that is used so right you know, oh yeah like the drawings I mean, right what's that I, I the drawing the, they're, they're like black and white pencil drawings kind of looking uh some images. Of, 
Yeah, I know not all of them are NCMEC drawings, but but there are a few instances where there was a NCMEC image or that that uh, you know that they wanted to be used as the you know as the uh, as the image the that's actual thing that, mm -hmm. that's associated with that case. So. So when in those instances when they request that they go ahead and say okay even if even if I have my own image that I've done on that same case they you know that's fine if if they want right you know, want their their image used that's fine hmm. so very interesting well I'm trying to think um, is there anything else you want to mention. Being on here, uh, I know we've talked about a lot, but <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think I've run the gamut. I <laughs> nothing <laughs> comes to mind. Uh, I'm sure you know what they call the the wit of the staircase is as soon as you walk down the stairs, you remember what you were going to say when. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you're having an argument with somebody, they call it the wit of the staircase, where. You know, as as soon as you walk down the stairs, you you finally remember what you were going to argue when. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, true. so true. So true. Um. Oh. Oh, I just had a really good question. Where did it go? <laughs> Hold on. Um. Oh shoot. Rats. Oh, uh, I mean, if you could uh, like guesstimate, estimate. How many renderings would you say you've done over time? Oh, over the 10 years I've been doing this, I mm -hmm. probably have, I have more than 200 images that I've done. I mean, I have a whole directory full of, and you know, most of them have been re done and redone. Uh, there's a few that I, you know, that I've done once and never redone, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's probably 200 images on my hard drive of various dough cases and age progression images that I did back when I was doing those. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's probably, probably more than 200. Can I mention that I saw you on the, the Long Island serial killer documentary? Oh, no, Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Cause I don't think you used your real name. You used your web sleuth name, right? <laughs> Carl K nine zero two four five. Yeah. That's yeah. It's, it's the city of El Segundo is a zip code for the city of El Segundo is nine zero two four five. So I use that as my oh Carl, Carl K nine zero two four five. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So I I mean for all the all the people who listen to victimology, if you have not watched the Killing Season yet, I highly recommend you do. And um, I happened to watch it um, a couple nights ago and I was watching and lo and behold <laughs> Carl graced the screen <laughs> and right before we started to record I had asked him I was like was that you <laughs> <laughs> so they had you on to talk about the male victim in the Long Island serial killer case right yes the transgendered uh, uh, Asian male that was was an Asian male who was wearing female clothes and uh, he was one of the Long Island serial killer victims, and I, I had discussed on Web Sleuths, you know, years ago. I I came up with this possible match of a, was a Chinese uh, transfer student uh, named Mo Zhang who was from, uh, from Virginia. I think he disappeared from Virginia, but was never seen again. And and uh, I was just noting how closely his facial structure fit the facial drawing. That yeah. They had. I mean, yeah. And I actually did a little gift that, you know, faded in and out the, you know, <laughs> back and yeah. faded back and forth between the the drawing and the photo of his face and and you know everything lined up perfectly. So, you know, I don't know if that's Mozang or not, but but it sure was close. And the you know the people that who were doing the killing season were, you know, impressed by that little presentation. So they brought me on and you know had me just <laughs> spend thirty seconds right. discussing it. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that illustration you did, or the, I can never say it, GIF, GIF. GIF, yeah. The, the little video thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, like, actual, like, transition between both, it was, like, uncanny. I mean, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. 
Like, yeah, I mean, then that's not proof positive that it's the same person, but it's like, okay, well, this may be something you need to look into. It's, <laughs> you know, right. I mean, was that actually like tipped in to law enforcement? Yeah, I, I actually called that into, you know, to the Long Island serial killer tip line. Mm -hmm. And they probably get hundreds of calls. I don't know what they ever did with it. And, you know, they were asking me, well, you know, didn't they say, you know, didn't you tell them, don't you know who I am? And I was like, well, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I don't <laughs> call law enforcement agencies and say, don't you know who I am? It's like, they don't know who the hell I am. But, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I think at this point they probably do or most. Do. I don't know if they do or not, but that's not, you know, that's not how I would yeah. approach. Yeah. No, well, yeah, you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, uh, you know, I, I, I called in the tip and they said, thank you for the tip. And I never heard back from him. And so, so actually, you know, Josh and, you know, the, I forget the. <laughs> What's her the, name? Um, uh, oh, I should know it off. Um, anyway, the, the, uh, you know, the they actually did a follow up on that and contacted the law enforcement agency in Virginia. And they said, well, we've closed the case because, you know, he was just a uh, a uh, transfer student from China who, who, you know, wandered away from a from a you know bus group and never came back. And they just figured he voluntarily left. So they closed it. And so it's even though they've never found him, it's a closed case. So, yeah. And, you know, he has his family's in China, so, you know, there's no DNA for him or no fingerprints or no, you know, mm -hmm. dental records or anything to identify him in the system. So, you know, it's just still an open question. So, and then <laughs> they have no interest in trying to, trying to find his family in China to see if he ever came back home or what, what happened right. to him. Right, right. So have you ever done, um, speaking of the Long Island serial killer case, have you ever tried to do your own rendering of the Jane Doe that was found? Uh, well, I've never had access to any you know, images of their skulls. I, I'd love to, you know, attempt to do, you know, a few of those cases. I mean, there mm -hmm. are drawings out there, but, you know, if, uh, if I was ever to, you know, Get kind of get a hold of a, mm -hmm. any of the photos of those skulls. I I'd love to do it, but they haven't been available. They haven't. Uh, mm. So I generally, you know, the the ones I'm able to do are the ones that are available on and available online. And in some instances, there have been photos that have been given to me by you know that aren't ordinarily available and that I've been able to do images of. But mm -hmm. but. Uh, not very often that I'm able to get a hold of these, right? Right. If they aren't already, you know, made available online by the law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. Well, they should make them available because at this point, I mean, yeah, I mean, now and then, you know, I'll have a law enforcement agency contact me and say, "Can can you do something with that skull?" Uh, there was that victim of Samuel Little, a woman from. Uh, I think it was 1977, I believe, uh, Tuscagoola, Alabama, or mm -hmm. is it Tuscagoola? Yeah, I think that's what it was. But uh, um, it was a Jane Doe, a black female that, that uh, they had a skull photo of, and they sent it to me and asked me to uh, to do a depiction. So I was able to come up with something for him on that. So, mm -hmm. you know, we'll use we'll yet to see <laughs> how accurate it is because, yeah. uh, you know, she's still never been identified. So, mm -hmm. um I have a feeling that I may not have her hairstyle right, but I, you know, I think facially, I probably, you know, mm -hmm. probably have her, her depicted pretty accurately because mm -hmm. it was a pretty high quality photo that they gave me of the skull. So, yeah, you know, that's always nice when they have a have it photographed correctly and you know the mandibles aligned correctly. And I think there was one one time I had, I did an image that all they had was a photo of the holding the skull up in their hand and they didn't have the mandible or align properly and mm -hmm. you know I did a I did an image and it didn't turn out you know when she was it was a DNA doe project case that they solved yeah, a, yeah. Um, a case out of Oregon from 1971 but I was a little disappointed in how, how well that turned out it was probably probably the result of you know the 
the alignment of the jaw wasn't uh, wasn't mm -hmm. right when they you know in the photo that I had of it. So and that's crazy how one little thing. I mean, that's not necessarily a little thing, but like how one yeah. thing can just you know change the entire way someone yeah. looks or, you know, it's, but it is important that they've, you know, they're photographed properly. Cause if, you know, they, you know, they're just holding it up there in their hand. It's, uh, you know, it, it doesn't give a good, no, I'm sure you know, good perspective of, of, you know, the proper dimensions. Right. Oh uh, yeah. That's bizarre to me that they would be holding a skull. And then that's how they took the picture instead of yeah. setting it down. <laughs> that's yeah. interesting. That is. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, when, when she was identified, I, I was disappointed that, you know, she didn't look anything yeah. like I had depicted her. So I mean, that was one instance where, you know, I, I mean, I've had plenty of successes where I thought, okay, I did as good as I'm going to do, you know, as, as I could do given what I had, but, um, but yeah, that was one of the instances where I wasn't very happy with how it came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, I, I mean, I'm just like trying to wrap my mind around the fact you can basically do this process to, you know, I guess like re... That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Revitalize the face. Thank you, yes. <laughs> it's like is it revive um, yeah, I, <laughs> not but, revive. Um, yeah i mean it's just i mean it's so cr i'm trying to wrap my mind around it how i mean that you can like look at a skull and digitally i mean like you know it's like one thing if i think i don't know if you maybe mentioned this in the vice video which i'm gonna tag down below so everyone can watch yeah. it um that you had said like when they're like a little bit more pressure like when they're more like recently deceased they have like a little bit more fullness yeah. to them uh -huh. and i'm i mean it's just already crazy that you can do i mean like some of them it's just like oh my gosh that is like a picture of the person um yeah. <laughs> but it just like like i said it just blows my mind that you can do that with the skull and they turn out like pretty accurate i mean that, that's crazy to me yeah, well, you know, if you have a basic knowledge of anatomy, and it's, it's interesting because you can see, you know, a skull tells you, there's a lot that a skull t can tell you. It's uh, like there's, you can see where, like, for example, on the eye sockets, you can, there are points on the inside and outside edges of the eye sockets that indicate what, the way your eyes slant and the way, you know, where the eyes attach. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so if someone has back slanting eyes, um, you know, you can see that on where on the little nodes on the on the eye mm -hmm. sockets. Um, mm -hmm. Noses, you know, there's a what they call a nasal spine. It points up, it points down, it indicates the way you know people whether you have an upward pointing nose or a downward pointing nose. Um, you know, you can still tell the way the nose projects. You can, you know, even. You know, even if you can't see what the tip looks like, you can get the basic uh, size and dimension of the nose. There's a lot of things you can see um, from just the skull. Now, did you go to school for any of this? Did you take like a graphic design yeah, type in class? College, I took an anatomy class. It's just one of my, um, you know, junior college. But it was just an anatomy class? That's it? Yeah, yeah, I had human anatomy and uh it was kind of funny because I'm you know, I was just a business student and you know I had to pick a scientific elective and you know a science elective for you know to get through my college work and I said, "Well, okay, I'll take anatomy." And most of the people who are taking anatomy are doctors or people who are, you know, in medical school or right. people who are going to be going to medical school, but you know the the professor was always a little bit you know, amused that, you know, what's this business student doing taking, you know, the type of classes that that ordinarily people headed for medical school would take. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just figured it was, it would be helpful to what I, you know, my, my drawing skills. And I've always had the, you know, the ability to draw faces. So I figured, okay, well, anatomy 
should be uh, pretty helpful to that. Right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, and I, you know, I mean, I took life drawing classes in in college as well. I mean, but you know, just as you know, additional electives, you have so many mm -hmm. hours of elective <laughs> elective courses. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so it, it ended up. I mean, like, could have you ever imagined yourself doing this? Like, did you ever think, like, at that time, like years later, you'd be helping? No, no, I, you know, it really was just kind of on a whim that this all got started. Of course, you know, I've been drawing faces since I was young. And since I was in high school, I, you know, I like to draw faces. But but I never I've always known that that wasn't something I was going to make a living doing. It wasn't going to be my occupation because you know, there's a term starving artists and there's a reason why there's a term starving artists because artists don't make money and you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, very rarely do, you know, can you really make a decent living doing artwork. Mm -hmm. so I mean, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I know very many people do make money, make the money after they've died. It's, uh, it's know. true. It really <laughs> is true. I feel like they should prepare people more for that one. <laughs> When they try to, yeah, you know, uh, like get ready because it, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, a lot of people do it, but very few people actually can. And living in Los Angeles, it's, you know, the cost of living is pretty high. I, I could never, you know, make enough money doing drawings to, you know, keep my mortgage afloat. Mm -hmm. So you work full time in addition to doing this. Yeah, and you know, after my mother passed away and we sold her house in El Segundo, we, I, uh, I bought this condo in Torrance, and so, um, and I'm kind of doing, working for a temp agency actually, but I'm I'm a salaried professional, so I'm a, I'm a you know I'm I'm on salary. I'm not just an ordinary temp worker, but, mm -hmm. um, but I'm doing temporary work, and I'm happy doing that because it's, you know, the hours are okay. It's, you know, yeah. for manageable hours, I, I work an eight-hour day and I'm done. I don't, you know, ordinarily, if you're in the accounting business, during especially during month ends, it, a lot of times they'll keep you around till 11 o'clock at night. And oh, jeez. <laughs> I get paid to stick around till 11 o'clock at night. You're, you know, <laughs> you're working whatever hours they want you to work and, you know, you're getting paid your salary mm -hmm. regardless right. of how many hours you work. So, so if you were given the opportunity to do this full time, like working with the DNA Doe project, if something were to come up, would you choose to do that full time? Well, if I could continue to make my mortgage doing it, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, DNA, as I said, DNA Doe project people are all volunteers. There, you know, there's no no uh, anticipation that I'm going to be making any money working yeah. with them. But you know, if there was some sort of field I could get into that utilized that process and I could make money doing it that <laughs> I'd be glad to but but you know I the money I make as an accountant is much more of a sure thing than oh I'm sure yeah 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 than money doing you know forensic drawings Mm -hmm. have a few hundred dollars a piece that's <laughs> right you know, right but yeah you'd have to do quite a few of them to make a you know to make your mortgage at the end of the month mm -hmm. so is there somewhere that people can donate to the dna doe project yeah they will they have a a, a website and a means to donate online so if you go to uh, dna doe project org uh there is a uh you know a I don't know if it's GoFundMe or you know some electronic means that you can mm -hmm. um, you can donate online, and you know we urge anybody who's who's interested in this to if they wish to uh, to donate because you know we're doing a lot of good work and we're um, you know bringing a lot of uh, resolution to families who you know who've been wondering for for years. Mm -hmm. An interesting case I probably uh, might add in is. Uh, there was this case from 1968, a very interesting story here. Um, a woman 
was found in Griffith Park, California, dead at a picnic table. She had died of a of a morphine overdose or heroin overdose. Oh, geez. And uh, she was early 20s, pretty woman, bleach blonde hair. Uh, this was 1968. Uh, she had a ring on her finger with uh, two sets of initials, a CB and EJ, and a date, on, uh, September 4th, 1920. And... It was obviously not her wedding ring because mm-hmm. she wasn't that old. Mm-hmm. And, but that was the only, and there was a clue that her name might be, uh, or that she checked into a motel under the name Cheryl Miller, but that they didn't believe that was her name. And so, you know, this was 1968. It went nearly 50 years. She was unidentified. And I had put that case on my Facebook page. And I had a drawing I had done of her, and I had a little Hollywood sign in the background to, mm-hmm. as a backdrop. And uh, I had no idea, but a woman I worked with uh, 10 years prior at Princess Cruises, a former colleague of mine who had been a Facebook, been following my Facebook page, she, she saw that and decided to try to solve the case herself. Never oh, said wow. anything to me about it. I, I had no idea. But um, one morning she called me up on the telephone and said, I solved the Griffith Park, <laughs> the Griffith Park Jane Doe case. <laughs> I'm like, it's like, oh, you're kidding me. And, you know, I was fully expecting her to come up with names of the common missing person listings that, that yeah. you rarely see online. And, you know, she says, oh, her name's Cheryl McMillan. It's like, Cheryl McMillan? I don't know of any missing girls named Cheryl McMillan from, from the listings. Right. So and I then all of a sudden I realized that what what happened was she had seen my my uh, Facebook post mm-hmm. and saw the the clue with the ring and went on Ancestry and spent about a month going through Ancestry trying to find a marriage record for a couple with with uh, the initials C B and E J who were married on September fourth, nineteen twenty, and eventually she found the couple. Uh, Charles Bush and Edna J, spelled J A Y, and they were born. They were married on that date, and oh they gosh. had two daughters. And she she did all the genealogy and traced down, found out that they had a grandson who was living in Clovis, California, a man named John Manzo. And so she found his Facebook page and sent him a Facebook message and said, "Are you the, are you the grandson of Edna J?" He says, yeah, that's my grandmother. He says, do you know who uh, might be wearing, who, who might have gotten possession of her wedding ring? Because uh, there was a Jane Doe found wearing your grandmother's wedding ring. Mm-hmm. He says, call me. So she, so she got him on the phone and she said her hands were shaking. And she said, uh, he says, my sister's been missing since 1968. When was your Jane Doe found? So, uh, oh my gosh, 1968, 68, 68, 68, 68. <laughs> oh my gosh, though, that's and crazy. So, uh, and you know, so she showed him the picture, says, Yeah, that's that's my sister. <laughs> so, uh, so they ended up resolving that case because this woman was, you know, decided to take it upon herself to follow up on the clue that I had given on the Facebook page. So you know, I, <laughs> that was really kind of an exciting thing because it had been 48 years by that time. He is, he said he last saw his sister when he was seven years old. And wow. And, oh my gosh. Uh, and he, she disappeared and nobody knew what happened to her. And, you know, in fact, she died at a picnic table in Griffith Park. But, but, uh, you know, as he said, to my whole adult life, I've been wondering what happened to my sister. And now, um, now I know. So, and mm-hmm. unfortunately, their mother passed away only a couple of years prior. Oh, so she yeah. never did know. But, um, but that was exciting to really see that come to a conclusion that way. And you know, to see somebody who had spent nearly fifty years wondering what happened to his sister, and imagining the worst, imagining that she'd been kidnapped and mm-hmm. oh, sure, by yeah, a drug gang or you know, been held prisoner or. You know, all these terrible things might have happened to her, and you know, your your mind goes everywhere trying to trying to imagine what must have happened to her. And as it turned out, she just 
you know, died, died a relatively, uh, you know, peaceful death, I guess. As, as yeah, like when it comes well, down to it, I mean, yeah, he just, you know, took an overdose of heroin and passed away at a picnic table. So. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness. That is, I mean, that's great. And it just goes to show you too. It, like if like anybody puts their mind to it, like anything can happen pretty mm-hmm. much. I mean, like right. that's, you know, that's she's, just so she's crazy. Kinda, like me in that respect, you, you get, you set, you set yourself, you know, a goal to, to solve a case and you know, you don't let go very easily. And she's kind of the same way, I guess she decided you know, I'm not going to stop looking until I find a couple that with those yeah. initials who were married on that date. And sure enough, and, uh, wow. you know, and, and it's interesting because not all the states have have marriage records from that time period. So it just fortunately, you know, Detroit was where they were married. And the state of Michigan does have 1920s marriage records in Ancestry.com, mm-hmm. but not all of them do. So. You know, she just lucked out that she just, <laughs> this has happened to be a case of, right. of uh, you know, they had the right state with the right records and ancestry. Yeah. That we're able to uh, give her the information she needed. Oh, that's just crazy. I, I, but I mean, like, I love that, though, because it's like, you know, a case got resolved. I mean, mm-hmm. and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be like people who die by like horrible violent deaths it's, no, I mean, it's, it can be just you know anybody and i, yeah, I think that's kind I of think that's the saddest part that's kind of a misunderstanding among a lot of people that you know you're only that we're only interested in you know like gory homicide cases and that's not always the case a lot of our cases are just people who died in natural causes or you know for whatever reason there we have suicides we have natural causes deaths we have and we do have homicides as well, but you know, it's it, not necessarily the interesting cases aren't necessarily the ones with the uh, lurid, um, right? Backstory. Right. Right. Wow. Well, Carl, is there anywhere that like listeners can follow you? I mean, like, uh, where, I don't where have can a website. See? I just have my Facebook page, and I have plenty of followers on Facebook. It's <laughs> It's amazing, as especially since that Vice video went out. I, you know, there was a period of time where I get thirty or forty friend requests a day, and that was going on and on for for like a month. <laughs> you know, right. it was like constantly this constant flow of friend requests, and I finally had to turn off my friend request button because there's Facebook limits you to five thousand friends, and I've I'm up over three thousand now. So, <laughs> oh jeez. <laughs> Had to turn off my friend request button to only people who are uh, friends of friends. So yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, you can find my my Facebook page and you can follow it. You just you know the friend request button is mm-hmm. disabled, but you can still follow my page. Still follow uh, it. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll definitely link that down below so people can follow you. Yeah. Um, that the DNA Doe Project. Um, they have most of your renderings on their website as well. Uh, some of them. I mean, you know, they they don't always use my image uh, on their cases. If, as I said, if the NCMEC mm-hmm. specifically re- requests that their image be used, then then that's fine. But, but uh, in uh, you know, in some, I, they do have some of my images. My my Ventura John, uh, County Jane Doe case has my own image for that, and mm-hmm. and you know, the Lime Lady case that we just uh, announced was my image on that so and there's uh another case we're working on a case out of uh um out of uh pulaski county missouri that uh that they're using my image for that Mm -hmm. the case we're working on right now um but yeah i mean all all my if you go to the uh the photo album section of my facebook page is all my most of my images are are posted there in in uh, in an album under the photo or the you know the photo album section. That's you go to the unidentified. I have a whole f- photo album of unidentified cases, and they all have a little write up along with them to explain the story of you know how this person was found and when and where 
and mm -hmm. you know any details that might aid in uh, in their identification. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I think so, a lot yeah. of the cases we talked about tonight are either I, I know I saw some definitely in the album, and then I saw some as well on the DNA Doe um, Facebook page, which I'm going to link everything down below okay. so everyone can access it very easily. But um, yeah. Well, great. So <laughs> you're saying we should definitely keep our eyes to the DNA Doe project this next year? Uh, yeah. I mean, we're getting new cases every, all the time and, and you know, there's a constant flow of uh, cases being resolved. I, you know, really mm -hmm. can't say <laughs> which ones are, are in the process of being resolved, but, uh, you know, there's cases all the time coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Um then people are excited to see, you know, a case they've been following for years, like the Lime Lady case, for example, or, that got a really positive response because that was a, one of the more uh, prominent cases on of that people had been working on. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are excited to see that case being solved. And now there's a whole mystery of now who did it. <laughs> you know? Right. So now right. that we know who she is, now, you know, now we can. Some people. I don't necessarily focus on the who done it part, but uh, mm -hmm. you know there are a lot of people online who like to focus on that aspect of it. So, mm -hmm. so now it's uh, you know the case is hot and running again. Right. So you're more of the who is it as opposed to the who done yeah, it. Who was I? Not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Not who who not did? It. Yeah. Well. Carl, thank you so much for coming on Victimology. Yeah. Okay, great. Now, nice talking to you. Uh, look forward to seeing what you put together on this. Well, here, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. A little disjointed, but... Uh... <laughs>